Okay, I think we can go to the first session, which is entitled Culture and Environmental Sustainability, Perspectives of Policymaking, Science and Research, Culture System Change, and Cross-Sectoral Synergies. Quite a lot of things there that we have on our plate, and we have only 45 minutes for a very interesting uh, panel that we will uh, that will be moderated by Jan Jaap Kno from the Boekman Foundation of the Netherlands. So we will have invited them to reflect on the European Green Deal, which is Europeans or Europe's flagship initiative. And um, we have asked the experts to explore how cultural policy. We now heard just young people bringing in some concrete uh, proposals. But how do you embed a green notion in culture policy? And so this will be the topic of the next um, or the first session of this panel. I'm not going to waste more time. I hand with pleasure the word to Jan Jan. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome in this uh, session. Um, we just heard some very strong messages from uh, two young ones. Uh, I don't know if everybody who is listening now also uh, heard them speak, but um, they had a strong message and they uh, actually said um, concerning the climate crisis, uh, the system uh, will change or it will end. So that is a, quite a strong uh, question uh, that we uh, are going to face in uh, the next 45 minutes with uh, three guests uh, that you will hear. Uh, each of our guests will uh, do a short statement of five minutes, then I will ask one or two questions, um, but not too many since we want to uh, have time also for a conversation between the three of our uh, speakers um, at uh, the second uh, phase of our uh, session. Um, I will briefly um, introduce uh, the three uh, speakers of uh, today to you. And uh, they will all in their own way reflect on the question uh, how um, cultural policy should uh, change if um, we want to overcome uh, the big challenge that uh, climate uh, uh, change is uh, putting uh, to us. And uh, one of the first, uh, the, the first uh, is uh, Alison Tickle. Uh, Alison, you are a director of uh, Julie's Bicycle. Um, I uh, read at your web website that um, actually you started this uh, organization of you in 2006 by uh, riding your bicycle, not your car, by riding your bicycle uh, to a meeting in uh, London. Well, you will have more time afterwards, but can you in one or two sentences uh, introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you so much, Jan, and everybody for being here. Um, I'm Alison Tickell. I founded Julie's Bicycle. Actually, we started officially in, in, in 2007, really focused on what the role of culture was in uh, meeting this climate crisis and what it needed to look like in a very practical as well as a creative and conceptual way. We come back to that uh, later. Eh? The, 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 our second guest is uh, Sebastian uh, Brunner. Uh, you are from uh, Germany, working at uh, the Kulturstiftung uh, des Bundes, uh, uh, when I say it in German, but uh, you can say it in English. Uh, please introduce. Yes, hi, uh, my name is Sebastian Brunger. I work for the German Federal Culture Foundation, which is a funding institution that promotes art and culture within the scope of federal competence. And I am the project coordinator of the funding program Doppelpass, Theatre Cooperation Fund, and I'm part of a team that is developing new funding approaches, such as recently a new theatre funding program, Jupiter, Theatre for Young Audiences, or right now a new project that supports carbon footprinting in cultural institutions. And we also hear more from you uh, after uh, Alison uh, has spoken. And from Germany, we move to Greece. Uh, we have uh, Christos uh, Karas in our uh, middle. You are uh, director of uh, the Onassis uh, Cultural uh, Center in Athens. Um, uh, on your website, I found a very intriguing uh, text that your center um, is a space where uh, art, aesthetics, and science meet. 
Um, can you elaborate one or two sentences on that before uh, I uh, give the floor to Alison? Yes, of, of course. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, Onassis Stehi, which is a division of the Onassis Foundation uh, here in Athens, is indeed a, a transdisciplinary art center. So it's not a theater, it's not a concert hall, it's not an exhibition space, but it's all of that at once. And it's especially a, a space in which we try and find connections between not only the art forms um, across the spectrum, but also their relationship uh, to, to society and the critical issues that society is facing today. Uh, so that's why we put the emphasis very much uh, on, on the way we connect uh, to, to various aspects of our world. Okay, thank you for that. Well, I think it's uh, time to move on uh, to uh, the statements. Uh, I mentioned already the two uh, young people, the two young uh, theater actors from Dusseldorf uh, we listened to, and um, they said uh, it's about something uh, bigger, uh, this issue, than just uh, saving printing paper. Uh, printing paper. I think, Alison, uh, you will agree with them, uh, but I invite you to share some more thoughts uh, with us on uh, uh, cultural sector and climate change. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan. And, and, um, and I'm very glad to be here on this particular Thursday morning and to share with you and my fellow panelists some good experiences of positive climate action um, in culture and in theatre. Uh, since the weekend, I feel much less dismal as a consequence of what happened in the United States, as I'm sure you do too. Partly because it speaks to a point that is very relevant and we've already heard about this morning, that the climate and ecological emergency needs all of us to work quickly, collaboratively and with an absolute focus. There is no time to lose. We know that this pandemic has shock, shockingly accelerated an inevitable great reckoning with our deeply broken economic systems, which are in turn breaking our planetary systems. This, we've already heard about this this morning and getting to grips with this emergency, understanding how theatres can implement radical change is frankly impossible to do, maintaining business as usual. So the rethinking is now an imperative. Julie's Bicycle is a company I started 13 years ago, which has been exploring this intersection between culture and climate since we started. Um, and, and most of that focus has been very practical. It's founded on two central ideas. One is that the climate crisis is in actual fact a cultural crisis, a crisis of values and a crisis of what we care for. And two, that we cannot wait for the existing system, the status quo, to sort this out for us because it can't. It's, it brought us here. We've got to change the system and that means a step change in cultural policy, investment, training and tools. We need a unifying and mobilizing international approach that embeds sustainability and justice into the fabric of theatre. So what might this look like? We have all the key frameworks in which national and international targets sit. There is the Paris Climate Agreement, the Sustainable Development Goals, the Circular Economy, Emerging Biodiversity and Nature Frameworks, and of course, the Green Deal. These together represent, I think, four key themes. Uh, there is decarbonisation, the immediate, rapid and urgent reduction in greenhouse gas emissions to net zero. Circularity, a waste-free economy that moves away from excessive consumption of finite resources. For free, there is nature, restoring, protecting biodiversity and natural heritage. And four, justice. And this last is perhaps the most important, because I have come in my 13 years of working in this space to realize that without justice, we are lost. The origins of the climate and ecological crisis are in large part founded on the prevailing attitude of human supre supremacy celebrated too often in culture over other forms of life, which has fostered an enduringly uneven global growth model which has dispossessed millions of people of land, livelihoods and degraded the natural world. So the story of climate change isn't found in the ice caps. It lies in the buried histories of human conquest anchored in cultural values that celebrate the idea of human supremacy. 
This is why the climate crisis is a cultural crisis. So where does policy sit in all this? Well, policy reflects our civic values and it is the tool of power that strengthens them and therein lies the opportunity. So Julie's Bicycle has been deeply involved in policy since 2010, recognizing that systems approach that we need to work with the system. Modeling London's theater, music and visual arts sectors early in 2010 with the city's climate policy. And since then we've consistently worked with cities, with organizations and with creative sectors on policy framing. Most notably with our Arts Council work, which in, in England in 2012 embarked upon the largest program of environmental literacy for culture anywhere in the world, making environmental requirements a funding requirement. That really changed the game. Over 800 arts companies have had to measure environmental impacts using our culturally specific carbon calculators and have an active environmental policy. This decade of data gathering and collective learning has generated invaluable data, but more importantly, cultural transformation and cultural transformation which aligns very nicely with the Green Deal. Together with many people, including Christoph, who you've met, Ben, Ifeyenya, We've co-created the largest sustainable cultural resource library anywhere in the world, and it's all free. You're welcome to it if you go onto the website. And during this time, a new ecology of creative climate practice has been emerging all over the world. And many of you might recognize us yourselves in this framework. They all map across to the European Green Deal, but I just wanted to very quickly finish on talking, on just naming them. There are five key areas of activity operating on two new working principles that need to be enshrined in policy. They cherish our planet. These two are collaboration, which is superseding competition, and pathfinding, which is superseding the status quo. We see this new creative ecology in one, artwork, curation, exhibitions. Two, our people, our campaigns, our activists, new cultural activists speaking to, to their truths. Three, organizations and organizational leadership. Our organizations embody our values. There's such a huge opportunity for theater to cohabit lead leadership, collaborating on change. Four, our makers, our social and material designers and our innovators. And five, our influencers, our policy makers and our funders. Here's the reality check. 2020 is set to be the warmest year on record and we are in the midst of a catastrophic extinction event. But we know we can do this. Emissions dropped by a staggering 8% this year and that is phenomenal. The reasons for that are extremely dysfunctional. We need to choose change, not wait for it to happen upon us. Everywhere, renewal is bubbling up and gathering momentum. And in this movement of change, everything matters. All the small actions and the connections speaking to cultural values that cherish and care. Theatre has a long history of activating social and more recently environmental change, but it is nowhere near enough. This year, in the run up to the next climate talks, the most important climate talks that we've ever had, and it is our last chance, Next year in Glasgow, the COP26 talks, we have a once in a generation opportunity to transform a creative economy that is no longer fit for purpose into an ecology that is equitable, collaborative, resilient and restorative. It is critical that policy meets that challenge. Thank, Thank you. you so much uh, for that. Uh, uh, So, so now you see, now me, you again. see me again. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, Alison, um, you've also uh, listened to the, the young ones, uh, the, the two uh, actors from uh, Germany, and it was striking that they also um, emphasized this importance of um, uh, uh, cooperation. Uh, but they also called for uh, more uh, attention for the small cultural in initiatives, because uh, it might be much more easier for big houses to uh, deal with this issue. Or do you think it's the other way around, that we need the small initiatives particularly? So very often we found that smaller 
companies, smaller uh, operations are much more adventurous in what they do. It's partly the structure, they can make decisions much faster. Uh, they're generally a little bit more uh, um, uh, experimental, a bit more, That's you find more innovation there. Um, so there's a lot to learn from big institutions that are, a lot of uh, new ideas are being trailblazed by smaller companies. Bigger organizations can do some of the structural shifts faster, and that means that uh, they can they can also take more risk. So I don't I wouldn't split this up. I think this is incredibly important that we locate ourselves wherever or whoever we are in this new ecology, creative ecology. Um, we recognize, and this is where policy becomes very important. We recognize where our agency lies. And we work out what we can do directly and what we need around us, what our, our influence might be. Um, so I, I, I think it's in, really important at the moment that we recognize agency and ambition everywhere we are in, in the creative community. We don't wait for, for another, for anybody else to do this for us. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we move on to uh, Sebastian and then later on I'll, uh, we'll come back to you as well, uh, Alison. Sebastian uh, Brunner, uh, you are from uh, the Bundesstiftung uh, Germany. You are a funding organization. Um, so I'm uh, very curious, uh, since funding is often so uh, important for cultural organizations, how you look at the um, the role of an organization like yours uh, in addressing uh, the issue we have at stake uh, today. Uh, please, uh, Sebastian, go ahead. Yeah, um, thank you for the invitation to be with you here today. Um, I would like to focus exactly on this, well, particularly on greenhouse gas emissions and cultural policy. Um, and well, you talked already about the challenges of climate change and political goals, and you mentioned the Green New Deal. Let me add from a German perspective, Germany's goal is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 55% by 2030 compared to 1990 levels. And these goals, of course, can only be achieved, as Alison also said, if they are understood as a task for society as a whole. And this transformation process has to happen in the cultural sector too. So it's not only a matter of art itself to creatively shape this transformation process and to make the dramatic changes tangible and tellable in a way through art, but it's also a matter of uh, the production of art and the carbon footprint of art. And at least in Germany, in the cultural landscape so far, I think we lack a broad knowledge and experience in order to implement specific cross-sectoral approaches. Something that Ellison already uh, called uh, environmental or carbon lit literacy. And, uh, but we also lack tools and guidelines in the cultural sector. And this is where policy making comes into play. And even though the German Federal Culture Foundation is not a policy maker, a classic policy maker, we are not part of the federal government. Of course, we aim to have an impact with our funding programs and uh, with our funding guidelines. And we try to set examples and promote possible role models in order to initiate and support transformation within cultural institutions. But how do we do that? Uh, we, we're not simply imposing prohibitions, neither we believe in plain voluntary commitment. We go something like a middle way. We try to develop funding programs that do imply restrictions, but we do it together with artists and cultural institutions. And we provide platforms in order to do so. So um, let me give you an example. Last year within the program I manage, um, within the theater program Doppelpass, we had a gathering of 150 theater makers um, and we discussed questions like how can we work internationally and ecologically in times of climate change? What kind of funding would be technically possible and artistically interesting? How about climate justice in the cultural sector? And none the least, does artistic freedom and ecological sustainability fit together? Back then, last year, the majority of participants said um, quite clearly, we want more rules, we want strict guidelines, and only few participants saw this as an inappropriate intervention into artistic freedom. Well, that was last year before Corona. However, as a reaction to these discussions, 
This year, uh, we set up a pilot project that supports 20 cultural institutions in carbon footprinting and reducing their carbon footprints. And participants are museums, libraries, concert halls, theaters, also theaters uh, which are among us, like Stadtschauspiel Dresden, Schaubühne Berlin, Musenturm, Kampnagel, Staatstheater Darmstadt. And we want to set an example in Germany and we want to learn with the institutions what are the insights when you do carbon footprinting, how hard can it be, and uh, what are the possibilities to reduce the footprints. And um, one of the consequences of this pilot project could be for us next year exactly linking the distribution of funds to aspects of ecological sustainability. Thus, eventually some or eventually all projects funded by the foundation would have to meet the requirement of carbon footprinting and develop specific goals to reduce the footprint. This is quite similar to the approach of the Arts Council and Julie's Bicycle, though it is more complicated in Germany because of its federal structure and the foundation does only provide project funding and now there's Corona, but I'm deeply convinced that we have to tackle the issue despite Corona or particularly because of Corona. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, you uh, seek in uh, Germany the you seek in Germany a kind of middle way, as you describe, and eh? not so much uh, impose uh, uh, restrictions on the cultural sector, but by way of uh, talking with the cultural uh, sector, see in who, how you can make uh, uh, together uh, uh, progress uh, when it comes to address the uh, issues of sustainability. But having heard Alison's talk, uh, and, and she, she had a, a quite an urgent uh, message um, do you think uh, that is enough? Uh, uh, shouldn't we be uh, more uh, strict and, uh, and, and do more in terms of um, uh, conditions for subsidies, in terms of uh, norms or um, uh, accountability of cultural institutions? Um, can you elaborate a bit more on that? Yeah, I wish we would well, we, I wish we could be more bold in this sense, um, but I also think that cultural institutions are facing so many challenges. It's not only um, ecological and environmental issues, it's uh, hierarchies, it's power, it's Me Too, it's diversity, the digital um, issues. And uh, so there are so many topics and uh, we have to somehow well, at least our understanding is to give an example and um, to have a group that can set an example and, and somehow lead a way. I, we don't believe that we have to lecture all those in institutions how to perform their change. And um, so also focusing on the part of the dialogue again, I think it's crucially important that in this sense, artists and cultural institutions get involved in the dialogue with policymakers as well, because Change is going to happen anyways, and uh, it's simply an open question how, for example, Harald Welzer uh, puts it, whether it will be changed by design or changed by disaster. And uh, we still have the opportunity to shape or at least influence the conditions of artistic work in, in Germany. And I encourage artists and cultural institutions in Germany very much, but also on, on an international level to get involved because it's not only a matter of money, it's a matter of ideas. And so if you have an idea, step forward. Yeah. We have to yeah. do this together. And in, in, in that sense, um, Alison, uh, she, uh, she gives culture uh, a, a unique uh, position in this uh, uh, discussion. And she actually uh, says uh, it's not uh, only uh, a climate change uh, that we uh, have to uh, face, but uh, to uh, face that climate change, we need cultural uh, change. Uh, so she, she strongly stresses this unique position of, of culture. Do you agree with her that culture has a indeed unique uh, uh, position in this discussion that is not the same as, well, let's say the sports or the, or, or the world of, um, of other industry or? I, I agree, I, I totally agree um, because like from a scientific point of view, they always say we, we put out the facts, but culture um, can make it tellable, tangible. And so the role of art is very important and the role of culture institutions is very important because um, from, a, from a self perspective and self understanding, especially from theaters, 
they understand their role in society in the middle of this transformation process to initiate and to um, to initiate change and to be critical. So, um, but my point would be, it's not the art itself. It has to be the way how the production of art itself um, as well. Um, not just to basically preach it on stages and in exhibitions, but also to live it themselves. Okay, thank you. I'll come to back back to you later. But we move on to uh, Christos uh, to Athens, uh, where uh, Christos Karas is uh, director of the Onassis uh, Cultural uh, uh, Center. Um, uh, a big house in terms of uh, theater uh, organizations, uh, I think. So uh, I'm also curious, uh, Christos, when you will talk, how you uh, see the the difference between uh, big uh, theater uh, houses and, and the smaller ones. But um, please uh, take uh, the floor and uh, let us know how you as ex executive uh, director of a a, a, a big cultural organization are working on uh, sustainability. Uh, well, thank you very much for, for the invitation. Uh, we've been working for about three years now in collaboration with uh, Julie's Bicycle, hi Alison, um, and uh, to, to improve uh, overall uh, our, our performance at the level of, uh, of culture, of sustainability uh, and our output, our impact on the environment uh, and in uh, other levels as well. Um, I think it's important to, to say that the only way to approach this is in a sort of holistic way. You can't, you can't uh, work at one level and not at all the others. Uh, so we were discussing earlier about whether, you know, attitudes and mentalities and perceptions have to shift first. Uh, or whether we have to do other more structural things. And I think it goes both ways. These things have to happen simultaneously. It's like a widening of the circle of awareness as we go. And the, the, you know, the thing is that dominant perceptions and public perceptions are quite volatile. Uh, at the beginning of the corona crisis, um, from Europe, everyone suddenly discovered the beauty of uh, lower emissions and everything. As time goes on, we read reports about people planning to travel more after the crisis. So, you know, perception is a perception and public attitude is volatile and you need to somehow fix the framework in policy and in your internal procedures in order to both maintain, uh, uh, let's say, the discussion going and actually make a practical difference. So I think it's um, in Europe, speaking of Europe now, it's a great moment with this new Green Deal that sets this kind of framework. I think in the cultural sector, uh, I think many of us are active in, in programs like Creative Europe or Erasmus Plus, or maybe even uh, Horizon, uh, Horizon Europe. Um, but I think it will be very important that this, and I'm sure it's the case, that these green policies will be reflected uh, in the funding and in the priorities that will be expressed uh, through these programs of the, of the European Union. The same goes for, for for each uh, state on its own. And of course, there's a very wide uh, discrepancy uh, here. Uh, but again, there has to be a lobbying on the part of the, uh, of the of society and of the cultural sector for a more, uh, more inventive, uh, let's say, incentives and policies uh, at a state level. However, we're talking about what we can do. And here as well, what we can do is actually uh, integrate policies and practices in our everyday uh, work. And this is what we have to, uh, to do. And in this respect, it's sometimes easier for a larger organization to do this uh, than a small one because they have possibility of measuring, of controlling, of assessing, of monitoring. On the other hand, smaller organizations can make a very quick uh, impact on what they do. And I'm talking about things, speaking from a larger organization, uh, things, structural things like uh, integrating green responsibilities into job titles and job descriptions, setting performance indicators of various kinds that are related uh, to, to environmental performance, making the procurement policy equally dependent on issues of environment as on just costs, working on the F&B outlets that we will have, you know, making sure that they also follow um, working on reducing our footprint, both in energy and printing and waste and water use. I mean, these are things that you have to integrate into your structure and make it known uh, outside as, as well to the public in order to show that things can be done and that this is a real issue on which you're taking action. So 
coming to a third level, um, I think what's important is that we realize to what degree we have communication power, uh, to use Manuel Castell's terms, especially these days when all cultural organizations are basically becoming broadcasters. That's what we do. We broadcast content, unfortunately, for the moment. Therefore, in a sense, we're like media organizations in a way, and we have to use this media power, this media presence uh, for the purpose of also getting out uh, the sustainability message, which we can only credibly do if it's part of the way we work. Uh, and at the fourth and last level, the most obvious one is how to, uh, Sebastian said this nicely, how to make this tangible through narratives, through stories, uh, through experiences uh, that our audiences have hopefully in the future in our physical spaces as well. But this is a very important thing, uh, but they go together. We have to change our system. The system supports the attitudes and the awareness. This feeds back into the system and so on. So it's not a question of prior. All this has to be done at the same time. Thank you. Okay. All of this has to be done at the same time. Um, it sounds so um, good. And yet, uh, so difficult. Everything has to be done at the same uh, time. If you would be in charge of um, uh, the, the, the European policy for the moment, what would be uh, your first step? If I were in charge of the European policy, I have to be very, very careful because I think Barbara Gessler is on the guest list. I saw her. So I have to be very careful what I say. Um, well, I think that um, definitely um, uh, what green policies, sustainability issues should be a part of the assessment uh, of uh, applications. And I think that just as there was a strand in the past for mobility, there has to be a strand now for environmental sustainability of practice. Uh, and since we mentioned mobility, this is, I think, a very complex and crucial issue because one of the whole points of, uh, of the European uh, support for culture is to create uh, intra-Europe uh, mobility of cultural actors and works, and it would be terrible to lose that. We all understand that there's a contradiction there um, with, uh, uh, with environmental issues. This is a very difficult conundrum, and it's made even more difficult because of the regional differences. It's very different being in Germany, Switzerland, France, or the Netherlands uh, to tour your production by train. And it's very different if you're in Bulgaria, Greece, uh, or Malta <laughs> to, uh, to Cyprus to tour by train or in sustainable ways. So there's a lot of work to be done there um, in preserving the vision of a trans-European cultural sector and building in uh, environmental uh, sustainability. So, so it's a very, very complex uh, issue. Thank you. I um, want to uh, bring you all back uh, in the discussion, also Sebastian and uh, Alison, uh, to have more uh, a conversation between uh, the three of you. Um, and my first uh, point would be that we have heard uh, Christos uh, talking about this need to in, in change of perception, uh, a holistic uh, approach, uh, he actually uh, uh, concluded. Uh, Sebastian uh, noticed that there is still so much lack of knowledge. Uh, Alison, you, you, you talked about carbon literacy. Uh, um, let, let, let me first start with this. Um, this point of is 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 there a, a lack of knowledge or, or don't we want to see uh, what is actually happening uh, to the climate? Also, we as people working in the theater sector, Alison, do you think there is, there is enough awareness that this is is really an urgent uh, thing? Uh, the short answer to that is definitely no. And and Christoph, I, I I really appreciate what you said about this need to to act simultaneously. That uh, so 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 to speak directly to your question, uh, Jan. I think there is a lack of knowledge. Um, I think that this feels very overwhelming. Uh, you know, when what we've done is to um, is to be bombarded by very big statistics that actually don't really feel like they belong to us, um, even though we are witnessing it bodily in our bodies, some of the anxiety, some of the grief, some of the loss, we see it around us, we see some of the inequity. 
But the frameworks for that really are quite technocratic. They're very often political. Climate change has been politicized, which is terrible. Um, and so therefore it feels that we don't really have a purchase over them. The first thing to say is that the more we know about climate change as individuals, as well as as sectors, the more urgent it becomes. So it does, it's, this is not a particularly easy journey on to go on. And you realize very quickly on that pathway that actually this is the only thing that really matters. It's a very generous uh, agenda because it reaches into everything that we do, all the decisions we make, but it is a very generous and a very regenerative agenda once you're actually on that journey. But it's not easy. And the most important thing is actually how you translate these really big stories, uh, these really big statistics, these really big frameworks into your everyday thinking and doing. And although it's not easy, it is very, very exciting, incredibly inspirational. It's an amazing opportunity to really think about ourselves in relation to, to one another and to the world. So but we need to know so much more. It, it, we have got nothing like enough urgency or speed what, to bring to what, what makes it so inspirational? Uh, do you have a, 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 an example you would like to mention that really uh, uh, shows that it can, be, um, it can be very inspiring, actually, that it can be fun to, to uh, um, do uh, work uh, on environmental sustainability? Yeah, so I'll talk about me first. I have had such a great time over the last 13 years meeting some of the best people in the world who are really engaged with this. I have been so blessed to be doing this work. Some of them are on this call now. Uh, so that's the first thing. And that's been deeply fulfilling. But on a broader level, the, 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 the uh, opportunity this gives us for creative rejuvenation and regeneration with a deeply ethical, moral uh, shared purpose to come together in community to rethink who we are in relation to this absolutely wonderful planet we live on and in relation to one another and our communities is the most exciting creative challenge that any of us could ever have. So uh, the short answer is what an amazing opportunity we've got. That is a great pitch. <laughs> uh, who is not convinced by that, uh, you would say, but uh, Christos, you have, uh, have a question nevertheless. A little question. I'd like to add something to what Alison said uh, about our experience within our organization here. Um, you know, a lot of people uh, uh, feel that they, a lot of people are aware of the climate crisis, but they're afraid they can't do anything about it. So within an organization like us, creating a green team which works across all the departments and reaching out to all the staff members and getting them engaged in actually doing practical things in their everyday work life um, has, I think, really energized people because they, they suddenly realize that they can make a difference in, in the way they work and, and the way they run their life generally. So I think, it's, I, I think that's also an, uh, you know, a form of, uh, of engagement that's important to support. Okay, um, Sebastian, um, uh, representing a, a funding organization that, uh, as far as I know, is also engaged in international work, uh, not only uh, project funding uh, in Germany itself. Um, how do you uh, look to the questions uh, about mobility? Since uh, over the, the past years, we have stimulated so much mobility between artists between students and uh, uh, like uh, Christos also um, uh, uh, pictured out, uh, there are uh, dilemmas of course, eh? and uh, the, 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 uh, coming, returning again to the two young uh, actors we've heard, uh, they had a plea uh, for um, uh, uh, being local active in culture. Your uh, sound, Sebastian. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Sorry. Um, totally. I, I think that's the most uh, difficult uh, issue, actually, the mobility part. Um, and as a cultural foundation, this is basically aiming at the um, at the core of our foundation as well, because we support international work and we want to continue to support international work. And so, uh, how 
how is that possible in times of climate change? And as Christos already said, I think there is not a general answer for everybody because it makes a huge difference where you live and where you want to show your pieces and where you want to work. And it's also a big question of climate justice. Uh, for European artists, it is a privilege that they've been able to travel for the last 40 years and now they maybe do it a little bit less, but uh, other artists from all over the world, they need this mobility. So I don't have an, a simple answer to that, um, but I'm pretty hopeful, at least um, from our discussions, that there are also artistic solutions to that, uh, to think about, is this, as Alison pointed out, as a chance to think of artistic solutions and productions that might also kind of reshape the way of how you don't need to travel for artistic uh, work anymore, yeah. or at least also at the time of curation, um, um, when you put together your festival program, there has been so much talk about how you can actually travel less and still make a good program. So I think it's, it's we come back to the, uh, the point of exchange, uh, to stay in dialogue. And, um, and from a policy point of view, well, to support, yeah. first of all, to support this, these ideas. And at least for us, again, it's the way of thinking of um, setting examples and to promote role models, how to do it. That would be actually our understanding to really promote good ways of working together. Yeah, but you wouldn't go so far as a funder, uh, or do you think that other funders should go that far that uh, they um, forbid flying with uh, subsidy money, for example? Well, um, of course, that's a discussion. Um, um, maybe not flying in total, but uh, for sure, short haul fl flights um, or national flights, um, that could be a question. But again, um, that could work maybe for Germany, but how about uh, Cyprus? <laughs> that, that doesn't work. So um, it, it, I think it has to be specific solutions then in the realm of, your, of the scope of your policy. Christos, do you think that would work for Greece? Uh, not Cyprus, but Greece, uh, no flying. Um, I don't think you. I, I don't think the solution is to have a complete ban on flying. It wouldn't work easily for for Greece. It's very difficult to tour uh, a production uh, from Greece by train. I think what we need to do is to really eliminate any non any non essential flying. I mean, I think I think we've all learned. Uh, from this experience that really you don't need to get up from Athens and fly to Copenhagen for a two hour meeting, right? That's something which we might have done, you know, uh, a year ago, I might have done it uh, stupidly, but I won't do it again. Uh, that's for sure, because I've learned I can do very well without it. And uh, as, as Sebastian said, you know, the whole curating process can be improved. So I think, you know, it would be a real shame if we can't keep this exchange of cultural production going through Europe. I think it's a super important part of what Europe is and what Europe could be. Um, so I wouldn't go as far as saying that we can say no flying, but I think we have to prompt governments to develop infrastructures that make flying less necessary. And I think as responsible professionals, we have to really not fly unless there really is no other way to, to, to get a result. Okay, thank you. And we have five minutes left for this uh, session. So we have to uh, use our time. I've seen your uh, hand, uh, Alison, and I will give all the three of you the opportunity for um, a final, a short uh, message, uh, if, if that's okay. Um, I have uh, one question from the chat that I want to uh, address specifically, um, since we have little time for audience participation, but now we have a question that is a question to Sebastian actually, um, and uh, it's from uh, Stefan Berman, and he asks, uh, you mentioned some uh, examples, but they were all from bigger venues. Uh, and he asked, is it more difficult for smaller structures to join um, your program? Uh, um, so here I am. Um, the, the, uh, I guess this uh, question regards the uh, the pilot project that we are doing right now, and um, these are basically uh, rather big uh, venues. That's true um, because we want to really well tackle the the, the big structures. Um, but for sure, as uh, also Alison and Christo said, um, eventually it has to be all um, of the. Um, venues as well, that's for sure. Okay, thank you. Well, Alison, uh, you um, uh, uh, 
are invited to make your uh, well concluding uh, uh, statement if you uh, like. Thank you. Yeah, just a, I just wanted to quickly pick up on the travel touring flight thing. First of all, there are mechanisms, for example, if we have carbon budgets, we can make choices around traveling, around uh, what we actually spend our, our, uh, our environmental uh, bill on. So there are ways where you can keep choices going, you can keep traveling, but you actually work within limits, which speaks to my, uh, my final concluding point, which is that really uh, it was made by, by Christos that what we do in a very intimate way actually needs to reflect what our policy is going to do, that, that, that we need to bring together intimate, small organizational or personal policy and values and, and meet, them, meet the bigger frameworks across them. And that really does mean that we have to very rapidly accelerate the knowledge sharing that we already have. There was a point that was made by the Fridays for Future team around disclosure, about really coming, coming being very open about what we do. And above all, the, be the biggest thing to say is really collaboration. Let's work together. Let's strengthen one another. Let's come together and meet this challenge together. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Sebastian, to conclude. Um, yeah, I would like to take the opportunity here to actually uh, tell a wish. Um, I think because it's important to address European policymakers and European funding institutions as well. And I wish we could continue this kind of exchange on a policymaking level and to come together and further explore the question, how can we link the distribution of funds to aspects of ecological sustainability. Not every country and not every country and not every county has to invent the wheel entirely new. And I think we have to share the experiences and knowledge because in the end, at best, there should be some kind of comparability or standard if you are an artist and are you are applying for funds at different places. For example, you're applying for a fund at the EU level and at the German Culture Foundation. And we all ask for environmental policies or carbon footprints. These requirements should not be entirely different. And uh, that would be great if we can pick up this thought and follow it up. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Christos, you have the final word. Well, the final, final word. Um, I'd just like to say, because you know, I think many colleagues might, might be sort of a bit scared organizationally of embarking on something like this. Uh, and what I'd like to say uh, in, in closing is that it's, it's, it's been, and it still is a great experience organizationally. It actually, it's done a lot of good to the organization uh, to work together for something that's so obviously good and uncontentious as climate crisis. So I would recommend, um, over and above the benefit to the universe <laughs> for the organization, um, it's, it's a good experience as well. Okay, thank you. And then we are back uh, at the inspiration that Alison also uh, uh, pictured uh, to us. Uh, I thank uh, you all uh, for your uh, very uh, clear, concise uh, uh, statements. Uh, I um, uh, can say to the audience that uh, in the next uh, session, we will go deeper into the theater practice. We will uh, uh, discuss then how uh, the theater organizations, the performing arts world can uh, really embed uh, sustainability in its uh, organization. Um, thank you again. And um, this uh, day has uh, the title uh, Making Progress. Uh, today is the uh, second day of the European Theatre uh, Forum. It is about making progress. Well, progress you can only make by, by setting small steps. I hope this discussion uh, added a few small steps to this uh, big uh, challenge that is uh, before us. And um, uh, uh, thank you all again and uh, uh, see you uh, later, hopefully during this uh, European Theatre Forum. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Jan Jaap Knoll for this uh, very dense session. Um, we're an, we'll announce a short break of 10 minutes now. The Zoom webinar will remain open during the break and then uh, we'll go on with the second session that has just been described. So see you later.